Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Wagner, and I'm honored to serve as the president of the Rotary Club of Tulsa. This will hopefully be the last Wednesday we'll be meeting only virtually. Beginning in January, we'll be meeting in person at First Methodist Church for the first three Wednesdays of the month. However, our club will continue to live stream all our meetings through Facebook. Before we begin, wasn't that uh, opening part, the music, wonderful. I tell you, Frosty the Snowman, that puts a smile on my face. I used to be a, a music teacher and I started off teaching elementary students. And I tell you what, I think I had more fun at the holiday time and singing Frosty the Snowman and all those wonderful songs than the students did. So anyway, those, those songs always put a smile on my face. Well, last week was certainly a busy one for the Rotary Club of Tulsa. We'll hear more about it next week when we meet in person, but I wanna especially thank Phil and Amanda Viles for all their work in organizing our Salvation Army bell ringing last Thursday. And then uh, Tiffany Eggdor also for organizing and setting up Shop with a Cop on Saturday. Two great events where there was just a tremendous participation. That's certainly Rotary in action and serving the needs of our community. Two great examples of Rotary serving the needs of our community at this holiday time. So thank you to those who organized it, but thank you then also to all of you who served. I had fun ringing that bell on, on Thursday night and we had a beautiful night too in front of the, uh, the Reesers at 41st in Peoria there. It was an absolutely beautiful night. No jackets actually were included uh, for that event. So thank you again all for serving and organizing. Greatly, greatly appreciated. Well, it's an honor to introduce our Rotarian of the Day, Prima Donna Braddock. Prima Donna is a life coach, ordained minister, motivational speaker, author, and actress. What a combination. What a great combination. She's a prime example of overcoming nearly insurmountable circumstances. Born and raised in foster care in East Oakland, California, from age 2 to 18 years old, she spent the early years of her life dealing with depression, low self-esteem and a poor self-image. Instead of using her past as an excuse, Prima Donna turned her obstacles into stepping stones to achieve her goals and help young women and teenage girls do the same. Prima Donna is the founder and CEO of Soaring Eagles Youth and Family Services Incorporated. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in radio, television and film with a minor in theater of arts from San Jose State University. She's also an alumna of Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma, where she earned two master's degrees of arts in marriage family therapy and Christian counseling. Wow, that's quite an quite a accomplishment, Prima Donna. Now please join me in welcoming Prima Donna Braddock. Madonna, you need to turn your microphone on. Oh, sorry, okay. Sorry to interrupt. I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Thank you very much, David, for that nice warm welcome. I've had the pleasure, I have the pleasure to introduce not only a, a good friend of mine, but my sorority sister. And I was just in one of her uh, a production, theater production, Doubt. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It was a film, so it was a stage production through which she has um, World Stage Theater. So. I had the pleasure to play Mrs. Muller in Doubt this past weekend. So um, let me introduce you to this amazing, phenomenal woman. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly McLeod Shinging is a vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion in, at the University of Tulsa and president of KMS Intercultural Consulting. She is a global diversity and inclusion specialist with over 30 years experience in the diversity and intercultural fields. Kelly specializes in healing racism, cross-culture competence, conflict resolution, mediation, storytelling, and inclusive leadership. She has facilitated workshops for educational, nonprofit, government, and corporate institutions in the U.S. and globally since 1989. Kelly is the co-author of The Culture Detective, African-American, and contributing author for Sage Publication on Prejudice, Bias, and Discrimination. 
a certified professional mediator and qualified administrator for the Intercultural Development Inventory, IDI. She holds a BA in communication and an MA in cross-cultural studies. She also has an accomplished actor and director. She also is an um, accomplished actor and director and founded the World Stage Theater Company in 2017, where she serves as the artistic director. Kelly is a member of the Global Community Dialogue, board member for the Tulsa YWCA, and is a past president and former advisor board member for the Society of Intercultural Education, Training and Research. Let us give a warm welcome to my dear friend, sorority sister, Ms. Kelly McLeod. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kelly. Oh, thank you so much for such a kind introduction, uh, Prima Donna, and it is always a pleasure. Thank you to all of you to welcome me uh, to speak to the Rotarians. I wasn't sure what to call you until you said that, David, and so uh, thank you, Rotarians, for allowing me to spend the afternoon with you all today. Um, as Pri said, you know, I am a bit of a thespian and a storyteller, and so almost everything that I do uh, begins a bit with a story. So if you're okay with it, I'm going to go ahead and share my um, my presentation. So just give me one second and I will pull that up. And uh, let's get it back to where it's supposed to be. All right, so we'll start from here. So what I really wanted to talk about was the best practices for fostering inclusion in the workplace, right? Um, I know that there are so many different organizations and many of you represent a number of different organizations, institutions, et cetera. And you might even be wondering, what's the difference between fostering inclusion personally and what does it mean if we're fostering inclusion within um, the workplace? So what I wanted to do is to bring you a little bit of that. But before we get started, as I said, I'm a bit of a storyteller. And so you might be saying, well, what's her story? One of my favorite quotes is by a woman by the name of Patty Dye. And she says that the shortest distance between two strangers is a story. So I hope that by the time that I tell you my story and go through this presentation, we won't feel like strangers, but more so like friends. And so I am inviting you into my journey and in my experience and to tell you a little bit about myself. So you'll see that there's some images on the right side of the screen here. Uh, the first one is Chicago, Illinois. I was born and raised in Chicago. I left Chicago at 29 years old. It is, it is where I am from. So when people say, well, where are you from? I always say Chicago, but I live in Tulsa because the process of being from Chicago for me is such an incredible part of my story. It, it tells you so much about who I am when I tell you that I am from not just Chicago, it's and I am from the city proper and from the south side. <laughs> so I'm not from the suburbs, you know, Chicago adjacent. I am from the inner city, um, one generation out of the projects and am deeply embedded in the culture of what it means to be a Chicagoan. And so that is everything to me. I left um, Chicago at 29 when I finished my, my degree, my bachelor's degree in communications, my undergrad, I mean, my minor was in theater. So one of the things that Pri has mentioned that we have in common is the fact that we are both actors and performers in, in, the, in the theatrical field. So I left Chicago um, really chasing Broadway dreams. And so you see the next picture, my goal, my aspirations was to become, you know, if not a Broadway star, it was definitely to take Oprah Winfrey's job. So um, Oprah wanted to keep her job, whatever, right? <laughs> so so I, I wanted to continue to work in the theater and I, I decided that I would spend a little bit of time working in Chicago before I took my chances in uh, Broadway. But what happened in the meantime was that I, while working for higher education, one of my very first jobs, my boss asked me if, if I would be willing to do the diversity training for our student employees. And at that point, I had no uh, training at all. I was a resident assistant in college, and I participated in some of the diversity training that we had available in the late 80s. 
but it was very different than being on this side and having to take other people through the training. I said yes, because there was nobody else in the room who wanted to touch it. <laughs> and I felt it was important enough for me to share that. So um, I started doing this work and I found that not only did I enjoy it, but I actually was, I had a knack for it because I used the power of story to connect across culture. You know, one thing that people love to do is to talk about themselves. And so if you put people in a room and you ask them to tell their story, then what happens is that people's hearts and minds opens up and you develop empathy and compassion. And some of the things that, you know, may have, you may have thought were going to keep you from the other or that you wouldn't have anything in common, you discover just how much you have in common. And beyond that, you begin to care. So I used my theater experience. I used my stage presence. I used the power of telling stories because that's what actors do in order to continue my journey in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so you'll see the last one is I got pulled into this work. This is about you know the reasons why I wanted to do it professionally. Um, it was because I really felt like everybody deserved, every human being deserved an opportunity to be their full selves and to have space created for them in every institution and in every part of the society. And so if it was, if it was up to me, then I wanted to do what I could in order to foster that, to, to make sure that I provided individuals with opportunity and did some of that bridging that I mentioned before, right? Explain the left hand to the right hand. Um, when I was in college, some of my most favorite things to do was to have these really great discussions. We would call them the meetings of the mind in my dorm room with people from literally all over the world. And then we would talk about our stories, our experiences with growing up being disciplined, right? I was of the generation where the parents still spanked. There were some of my friends who they didn't get spanked. <laughs> And they talked about how they were sent to bed without food. And, and we would joke and laugh about whose parenting was better than the other. Um, and, but we learned so much about the way that the world moves and how people learn their values and belief systems. And it was all through the power of story. And so I realized that that was something that was so incredibly valuable to the way that we began to learn about the other in this work. So I set out with that in mind and everything that I do, uh, including the theater company that we have because it's a social justice diversity based theater company. And, and our mission is to give actors and audiences access to the world by telling multicultural, inspirational and transformational stories to connect our hearts and minds with people, places and ideas. And that's really all that I intend to do as a practitioner in this work and why I'm committed to doing that at the University of Tulsa and any other institution that I have access to. So that's a little bit about me. I think what's important to note is that this whole process of diversity, equity, and inclusion is not about a destination. People say, Kelly, can you tell me, like, what are the five most important things that I need to do in order to create inclusion? And, and, it, and I say, you know what, it's not a destination. There's not an end point. My mentor used to tell me that once you figure it all out, then you're probably going to wake up in heaven because <laughs> she was like, because it's a lifelong journey and, it, and we never get to that final point where we do it right all the time. And so I say, even I suffer from foot and mouth syndrome. Even I continue to make mistakes and say the wrong thing, but I always try to invite in an opportunity to learn how to do things better, right? So it's about a spirit of cultural humility and the recognition that my story is only one story in, in a universe of possible realities on how to move through this world in this skin, in this body, and with the soul. So there are four important things about recognizing that destination, and it's that DEI work is really about both interpersonal and institutional work, right? So you have to work um, on ourselves and work with others, but we also have to be very intentional about the work that we are doing within our institutions. Sure, people make up our institutions. Yes, they absolutely do. So getting the people the training that they need to be more inclusive is critical, but it's also important for us to look at our systems, to look at our policies, to look at the way that we set up access within our organizations to see if we are inclusive in those practices. And if we do one without the other, then we are setting ourselves up for mitigated failure. 
unmitigated failure. So it's also about awareness. So we have to develop a certain level of awareness. What do I know that I don't know, right? If I'm only living in my own story and I am surrounded by people who are like me, live, work, and play, celebrate, and worship in the same way that I do, um, then I don't have an awareness of how anybody else shows up in a different way in their lived experience. So the first thing that I want to do is to become more aware of those different cultural realities. I also want to develop a little bit more knowledge about those different cultural realities, which means taking a little bit of a deeper dive. It's also important for me to know more about myself. So developing more self-knowledge. What is my culture? What culture do I hold? How does my culture play out in my relationships with others? And how does it play out in the workplace? One thing that I wanna assert is that every single individual you come into contact has a culture. I can't tell you how many times people tell me, well, I don't know if I really have a culture. I, I'm, just, I'm just Bill, or I'm just, you know, an Oki, right? And I'm like, okay, so guess what? Oki is a culture <laughs> and Bill holds a culture. So Bill holds a culture because of his home-based culture, right? What was that influenced by? Was it influenced by your education? your socioeconomic status? Was it influenced by your family status? Where you, did you have both parents in the household? Did you grow up with your parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles in the household? Did you, were you raised by a single parent? Did you, were you raised through foster care? All of these things will impact the relationships that you have with people because they're part of developing your self-knowledge and history. And they, without a doubt, influence how you communicate, what you value, and what you believe. I want you so you know that. It's important to develop certain skills to move forward. And then how do I work with the specific tools so that I can make sure that I am being more inclusive as well as fostering that inclusion in my, in my workplace or in my organization? So here are some examples of what it looks like when we're talking about um, self-awareness, uh, sorry, individual and institutional. So developing inclusion or fostering inclusion for individuals looks like self-awareness, as I said, developing more knowledge about my culture as well as other cultures that I might be surrounded by. So what's important for you know, um, the average Oklahoman to know about African-Americans particularly because of our history here in Tulsa around the race massacre? What's important for the average Oklahoman to understand about our indigenous roots, right? And so the more that we know about that, the more that we can develop empathy and compassion because people are bringing those experiences and those stories and frankly, historical trauma from those backgrounds and histories as well. So once we know some skills, we can begin to figure out how do I navigate that when I'm talking to an individual? Now you can pull those same things and put them into the institution, but there's additional work for the institution. The institution should explore its vision or its strategy, right? So what are we setting out to do when it comes to fostering inclusion within our organizations or in the institution? What specific policies provide access or could potentially prevent access to opportunity? And know that access is at the heart of it all. Nobody wants a, a, a hand out. Nobody wants to be just given something. Most people feel very encouraged and excited and validated by working hard for something. But what they'd like to know is that they have a, um, a fair share or an equitable opportunity at getting that. So let's talk about exactly what inclusion is, right? So inclusion is, as I said, about me, right? Because I have to know more about myself. What is the culture that I bring into the space? What is my culture? Um, as I said, how does my culture interact with other cultures? And what blind spots do I potentially have? And then it's also about you. I may have already said this, but culture is in everything and in everything is culture. So there's left-handed culture, <laughs> right? There is, as I said, Oklahoma culture. There is Southern culture. There's East Coast culture, West Coast culture. Prima Madonna can tell you a little bit about that. Um, but there, there is culture in everything and in everything there's culture. Sometimes when we talk about it, we think of it only as nation to nation or race-based culture. But culture is in everything. 
the T University of Tulsa has a culture. You all know that Harvard has a culture. You may understand that if you go to work for the Cowboys in, in Dallas, there's a culture, right? So there's culture in everything and in everything there's culture. And with that comes an understanding of what our values and beliefs are. And, and we will utilize those values and beliefs to communicate with others about what is important to us, how we expect to be communicated with, how we expect to work with one another. And so it would behoove us to know a little bit more about our own as well as others. So it's not just about me. It's also about me learning a little bit more about you. And at the end of the day, it's about us. So once I know more about myself and I know a little bit more about you, then we can figure out how to navigate this crazy, complicated world of cultural difference and sameness once we, have a, once we are aware of exactly who we are, right? So, so I'm not trying to create institutions where we end up having little um, Stepford wives, right? Where everybody is just like everybody else. There's richness in that cultural diversity. But what, we, what I am trying to foster or want to impress upon everybody is that there's so much richness and complexity and diversity of thought that comes with um, a rich, diverse population that we would work with, play with, or you know, socialize with. Your world expands significantly, immeasurably, when you are given access to people who come from different backgrounds, experiences, et cetera. So but before we get into fostering personal inclusion or individual inclusion and institutional inclusion, we have to start with some questions. <laughs> so before I can give you answers, because everybody's like, Kelly, give me the answers, all the answers. You have to first start with the right questions, right? And so the question you want to ask yourself is, why, am I, why is this important to me now? Why am I talking about this now? None of this is new, right? This is something that is true since the beginning of time in every culture on the face of the planet. <laughs> but why are we talking about this now? Why is it important for us to want to foster more inclusion? Um, and once we can be honest with ourselves about what that is, then we can begin to figure out how we will take our first steps. So if you say, why are we talking about this now? Well, it's in direct response to George Floyd, right? Okay, well then your first point of business is figuring out in what ways are people within your organization um, uh, unaware of what it means to develop an anti-racist institution, right? So what does that even mean? What does it mean to become an anti-racist institution, right? So you will start there versus okay, let's start immediately with implementing anti-racist behavior when you have no idea <laughs> yet what are the capabilities of the individuals within your organization. So sometimes we can start not at A, but we tend to start at you know, X or Y. And, and then we wonder why our, our efforts have failed, right? So we have to ask the right questions. What do you or your, other or, or your organization want? What does your organization want, right? So do you want to be more inclusive? Do you want to um, reflect the community that you serve? Do you want to promote more from within? Do you want to increase your numbers of ethnic uh, employees or ethnic members of your organization? So, so being clear and, and very specific and intentional about what you want, being honest, this is all going to hinge on honesty. And then if you decide, you know what, we want to increase those numbers. Okay, so you want to increase your numbers. Why do you want to increase your numbers, right? And what do you hope to, to gain from engaging with that cultural diversity? Do you think that it is going to add or is your expectation to bring people in and then hope that they will assimilate, right? So that on the surface, culturally, you have that diversity. But uh, on, but truly culturally, when it comes to values and belief systems, um, that's not necessarily the, the truth, right? That people feel as if they are being stifled because their voice isn't being heard, even though they're in the room, yeah? So, so why do you want to engage with that? And what are you prepared to do when they arrive? So how will you engage with them, right? Um, is it going to be question and answers? Is it going to be a welcome? Is it going to be, um, you know, an expectation? Oops, sorry. <laughs> Finger trigger, trigger happy or whatever. Um, 
And then what do they want, right? So if you are bringing in uh, populations that are underrepresented within your organizations or institutions, what do they want, right? Because they, individuals, have a desire to be in a place as well. So are, is it purely ambitious? Are they looking for this to give them access to something else? Do they want to contribute in a way that is going to enhance the organization? Do they feel like it has um, potential but could be a little bit more inclusive? So what do they want? Finding out that is going to be critical. Um, and if you have people who exist already within our organizations finding out what they want and what would keep them would be important. And to that end, we're talking about if they come, will they stay? So if, if they come, because this is something else that I've done as an independent consultant is I can recruit, I can help you recruit, I can tell you where to go, but can you keep them, right? And the keeping part starts with making sure that the culture that we are fostering for people is something that makes people want, feel seen, valued, and heard, and want to stay. Have you researched what would make them stay? Right. I mean, just simply doing a couple of Google searches. <laughs> what What are some of the best ways to keep and maintain cultural diversity within our organization? Are you an active listener? So when people tell you, when they begin to say what they want, are you listening, or are you only telling them what they want, right? Or what you want them to say. And then frankly, the bottom line is after you've asked some of these questions, you can ask yourself an honest question, are we ready? Is this something that we are ready to do now? Or should we put a few things in place before we start this initiative in June, right? Um, so these are the important questions that you need to ask. <clears throat> so here's some four best practices, right? So the first thing is to develop your strategy, right? You can do this independently. You can do it with a professional. Um, it is really critical to begin to lay the foundation for what is going to make sure that you are successful. So what is your strategy? And that goes back to all the questions before. What do you want, right? Um, consider what it takes to attract and retain the population that you want. Right, which means again, research, research, research. Align and connect. So this is about aligning your values as an organization or as an institution with your goals and desires, and then reach out to connect specifically with other institutions or other organizations or individuals who may support that mission. And then listen, right? Listen to the existing members that you have or the existing you know, employees that you have, and then listen with the heart to serve. Years ago, I used to have a, um, a car called Saturn. You guys remember those Saturns? Yeah. Well, I loved my Saturn cars. And the reason why was because when I purchased my Saturn, I felt seen. They had this big launch pad in the dealership that they would pull your car up and then they would have this big celebratory party for you. They take pictures and give you one of the Instamatic photos with you, with your brand new car. And then every year on my anniversary of purchase, they would send me a birthday card. So I felt so completely valued by, by them. Um, and when I would go in to get my car repaired, my, my seller would come over and say, hello, check in with me. Remember the names of my children. Forget about it, right? Nobody does that. They will remember the name of my kids. And I just felt like it was a family. And so when it was time for me to buy a second vehicle to, because we were expanding our family, I went right back to the Saturn dealership. On well, one particular day, my, we were on our way to the airport. The car, it was three days after I bought the car something happened to the gas line. And I called my, my dealer and I said, Hey, something happened to the gas line. We're on our way to the airport. Why is this happening? This is a brand new car. She said, stay right there. Somebody's going to come and get you, pick up the car, make sure you get to the airport in order to catch your flight. And I will be there waiting for you when you return. Just send me your flight information. I kid you not at midnight when we returned, my dealer was there her husband drove her to the airport so that she, well, followed her to the airport so that she could drive my car. She picked us up. I got into my own vehicle. She got into her car with her husband and drove away. Now that is service, my friends, right? Okay. 
And it wasn't just me. This was something, a story that I heard constantly about people who had a Saturn, about the way that they strove. And it was a goal of theirs. It was a vision of theirs to not, you know, serve, not just serve, you know, customer service, not just serve, but to surprise the customer. And they surprised me constantly. And so not only did they listen to me, but they served us well. And that was something that generated a great deal of uh, loyalty from me. So you can imagine that when General Motors bought out Saturn and then decided that they didn't have enough money to keep Saturn going, so they let go of Saturn and now it doesn't exist anymore, I was a little bit upset. <laughs> but it's okay. I have found another vehicle that I'm all right with, but it's no Saturn. <laughs> so let's talk about um, what it takes to develop your strategy, right? So we need to get leadership buy-in. It has to start at the top. The leadership has to say, this is important to us, not, yeah, well, why don't you middle managers go and do what we need to do, right? You have to believe in it and they have to see themselves in it as well. So we need to, um, diversity practitioners, and I wanna apologize for my field for the last 30 years, has not gone, done a good job of allowing our white male partners to see themselves in the conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, for a long time, when we talked about diversity, it always seemed like it was everybody but them, right? And so there was pushback because we'd use the words inclusion, but we were not being terribly inclusive. And we were pointing fingers at who was sp supposedly responsible, right? For the, the, the systems and injustice, et cetera. And that's not to say that those who were in, in positions of power and helped to make decisions years ago were not white men, but that means that we weren't necessarily allowing room for today's white men who want to be partners in this work to see themselves in this work and for us to give them room for that. So, so we need to be able to communicate that effectively. So if our leadership happens to be a white male, that we can get their buy-in because they'll see themselves in the work. Assess the institution. Find out its cultural readiness, and there are some things that you can do. There are online assessments. I, as I said, as Prima Donna mentioned, I'm an IDI certified administrator, Intercultural Development Inventory. So this measures your cultural readiness or your cultural competency on a particular scale and lets you know where your blind spots are and what work you need to do in order to be more inclusive as a leader. Create dedicated ownership. This means truly developing a position or having an individual be responsible for the efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives within your institution or within your organization. And that means dedicating a budget <laughs> because it takes money in order to make sure that you have the resources and the education that's necessary to move the needle. And then bottom and finally, explore what inclusion means specifically for your organization. So let's talk about this for a second, right? If you are in the middle of, let's say, Alaska, and everybody around you are, are um, you know, um, so white folks from Alaska, right? And the nearest cultural diversity that you might have is over, you know, 120 miles away, then when you're talking about the inclusion, that doesn't, it doesn't make sense for you to go straight into the race um, request. <laughs> well, we need more Latinos here. We need more indigenous folks here. We need more black folks here um, because it doesn't make sense. You're not going to be able to sustain it. And I'm going to tell you the truth. If they come, they're not going to stay because they don't have a community to support them to stay. Right. So does diversity or inclusion in that environment look more like maybe religious inclusion, right? Does it look like gender inclusion, making sure that we're giving access to people who um, might be one of the underrepresented genders within the organization, right? So if it's heavily run by women, then is, is inclusion bringing more men in? If it's heavily run by men, does inclusion mean bringing more women in, right? So explore what inclusion means for your institution. Let's talk about attracting and retaining. So my mom would always say that whenever we would have guests come over to the house, we had to clean house first, right? We wanted to make sure that our house was ready and prepared to receive people into our home. That's what we have to do with inclusion, right? We have to clean house. And I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about firing people <laughs> who are not on board. 
What I mean by that is really kind of holding up the mirror and being honest about ourselves, about what policies, practices, procedures, ways of being has potentially created barriers to inclusion. So once we find out what those are, try to work towards removing them and at least being honest about what those barriers are so that when people come in, you can say, we realize that these are some challenges for our institution, but we are working toward them. That's what I mean by cleaning house. Um, be intentional, right? You have to say what it is that you mean and mean what you say. Because one of the things that I'll say about underrepresented populations is that people are used to hearing what is unsaid, right? So if you say something, it means nothing. You have to, you know, as the old uh, adage goes, show me the money, right? <laughs> so I need to be able to see what it is that you are doing to foster more inclusion. And then roll out the red carpet. If you really mean this, if you really mean bringing people in, then you wanna give them you know, a wonderful orientation when they arrive. Make sure that you have set them up with different people to meet throughout the week. So the first week in the organization, have them meet individually with everybody who they could potentially working with or every leader. Just have an opportunity to have a conversation, a virtual coffee, and talk about who it is that they are. Talk about you know, their personal stories, but also talk about the story of why you, you became a member of this organization, right? So, um, and then give them a swag bag, give them a goodie bag upon arrival to make them say, to say, we appreciate you, we're so glad that you're here. A t-shirt, a mug, a pen, a, 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 what do you call them, a portfolio, whatever. Give them something that says, thank you, we're happy that you're here. And then mentor and engage with them. So assigning them somebody to, to have this relationship with who kind of helps them to navigate the organization or the institution. The other part is aligning and connect. As I said before, what's important is that we begin to develop consistent messaging about what it means to be an inclusive organization and make sure that that's seen throughout everything. Website, you know, um, uh, website, our, our uh, online stuff, our written materials, our brochures, et cetera. Have you implemented certain DEI measurements? So what are the metrics that you'll measure? If, if your desire is to increase cultural diversity, so what will that be? Will you have a starting base of right now, we have two people who are from, you know, underrepresented populations on our committee or on our organization, in our organization. And we'd like to see if we can, you know, double that by the end of the year, right? So what are your measurements? Provide diversity, equity, and inclusion training and education. Having uh, book clubs, videos and dialogues after that. Having um, external consultants come in and offer specific diversity training. All of these things will be critical to our ongoing learning and developing that stuff that I said earlier, developing our awareness and our knowledge. Mm -hmm. Offer some DEI awards so that you are rewarding people for the great work that they're doing, right? Um, so we don't want this to be punitive. We want to make sure that we are celebrating people for doing great things and creating inclusive spaces. So, so acknowledge people when they're doing great work. And then um, listen and serve. So listen and serve the workplace and the community, right? Acknowledge our indigenous community. Sometimes it's easy for us to be able to say that, you know, talk about our history, uh, particularly in Oklahoma, almost no organization can um, uh, talk about their history without acknowledging the indigenous land that we land on, that we are on, right? We're upon the historical, um, you know, uh, the historical truth of how the indigenous populations arrived in Oklahoma and then who was here when they arrived, right? So acknowledging that, you can develop a land acknowledgement or you can at a minimum be able to put that in your history, right? Support underrepresented or quote minority owned, I don't necessarily care for that language, but support underrepresented businesses and underserved communities. So if you know that you have a project coming up and you need um, food catered, consider going to you know um, an underrepresented restaurant and invite them to cater for you, right? So it is making sure that we're engaging and working towards the progression of economic advancement as well. 
when is possible, reflect the community that you serve and are working with. So work hard to diversify what that looks like. And then create space for people to feel seen, right? Sometimes that is developing things that they're calling employee resource groups or affinity groups. So if you do have a small underrepresented population within an organization, create a space for them or allow them to co-create co or self-create a space where they can gather and, and just be able to let their hair down and, and talk to one another and in, in a very particular language that they know is not the language of the dominant group. That is important for them. Um, and they're much resource to, 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 pr to provide you with that reflects not only when that happens, are people more productive, but they are more committed and loyal to the institution that gives them that space. So it seems like it might be divisive, but it's not. It's more inclusive. Okay, so I wanna leave you with this statement. If we don't intentionally include, we will inevitably exclude. So we have to be intentional about the work that we're doing. And we can't simply say, well, I just treat everybody like I wanna be treated. Because I have to tell you, culturally, sometimes the way that I wanna be treated is not the way that other people wanna be treated. <laughs> right? All of us know somebody who enjoys arguing. Guess what? I don't like arguing. So if, if I'm an arguer, I think I want to just treat everybody like I want to be treated. So I'm going to argue to show you that arguing means that you care and I care and we're getting to the bottom of this. Well, I don't want to be treated like that because I don't care to argue. So, so we have to be mindful of what does it mean when to treat others as they want to be treated and giving room for that, right? So treating others as they wanna be treated because treating others as I wanna be treated could potentially set me up for failure across culture, especially. And I can give you some examples if we have more time about how many times I suffered from foot and mouth syndrome with that one. All right, here's some of my favorite resources. Deep Diversity, Overcoming Us Versus Them by Shaquille Choudhury. The neuroscience of inclusion, really kind of talking about how our brains do some of this stuff on our own. So sometimes it's not uh, voluntary, our uh, desire to connect or disconnect with people. Sometimes it's just what our brain does because of our um, um, early man and our uh, frontal lobe and uh, that amygdala that responds to what are we connecting with and disconnecting with. And usually it means if it's similar to me, it's safe. And if it's different from me, it's dangerous, right? And that's something that we've been holding on to since the early days out of Africa or out of the caves, right? So it's just what we've always done. So understanding that can help us to open up a little bit more and, and challenge that when it pops up. Equity, how to design organization where everyone thrives by Manal Bopaya. And then subtle acts of exclusion, how to understand, identify and stop microaggressions. So I'd like to leave you there. Are there any questions? Because I am sensitive to the time. I think I'm just at 45 minutes. You're good, Kelly. So if anybody has any questions, please either put them in chat or just yeah. unmute yourself and, and ask them of Kelly. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, I worked at TU from 85 to 95. Okay. running the residence halls and we had our diversity training back then so i'd really love to hear from you a little oh, and i loved your talk thank you very much i'd love to hear what you're doing at tu and maybe how long you've been there and maybe some of your goals and what's going on there ah thank you so much for that yes absolutely so i've i've been at the university of tulsa since um, November 2020. So I'm, I'm just a little over a year and a month. Um, and so it's still relatively new for me, but I have huge plans. <laughs> first thing, the first thing that I really wanted to do was to uh, take a step back from some of the plans that the institution was doing. There was a diversity action plan when I arrived. And the more investigation that I, I did, the more I discovered that people were pretty much hamsters on a wheel, kind of just churning out stuff that had always been done without really questioning, why are we doing this? Is it still valuable for us to do this? Um, and what is the 
result, right? What's the return on investment for what was being done? So I put the pause on that and said, let's slow down and do an investigation. So we did a number of different surveys. I had what I called listening uh, circles. So I would have several different meetings with the leadership, um, with the dean of the colleges, uh, many of the chairs of the different colleges, all of the student organizations, the leaders of the student organizations, and ask them, what do you want for um, someone who is leading up the institution's diversity initiatives, right? So the, because this isn't just multicultural student resources, right? It's not just doing the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives for students. It's for the entire campus. So what does that look like? Um, what do the what does the deans uh, what do the deans of the different co colleges need? How is that different and the same from what the staff needs? How is that different or the same from what the students needed? So I have to be honest with you that I spent my first full year just listening and gathering information to figure out how to apply that. Once we gathered that information, we came up with four focus areas that we want that all of the work that comes out of our office would pay attention to. The first is diversity, equity, and inclusion education. That's a given, right? The second thing was that people wanted to feel as if they belonged at this institution. They wanted to know that they were valued and that they would have um, access to opportunity and promotion because they loved, institute, loved TU, so they wanted to stay here. So what we wanted to do was to foster more belonging on campus to make sure that everybody, every student, faculty, staff, administrator, from the president down to the grounds people felt ownership and felt as if they were a part of the community of TU. So we are in the process of developing um, programs, events, um, awards, banquets, <laughs> and all of this in order to make sure that people feel as if they are a part of the TU. The other one was about access. Many of our um, students, particularly those from underrepresented populations and those who come from rural areas, lower socioeconomic status, and our international students, haven't always felt as if they had full access to the institution. They would oftentimes feel as if they would be limited to certain things in certain areas. So if you're a lower socioeconomic student and no one in your family has ever gone abroad, you wouldn't even think about being a study abroad student. But we wanna make sure that they don't feel like finances is what is preventing them from getting access to travel abroad or to work abroad or to study abroad. And so we are working with our development and advancement office in order to make sure that we are gathering funds so that finances are not a prohibitor for our students to have access to academic opportunity. And then the last one is accountability. I'm sorry, not, account, um, uh, not accountability. Uh, it is about being an advocate for them. So advocacy. There are faculty who have felt targeted and othered and um, on the outside of different departments, particularly if they were women in predominantly male areas of, um, of education. And so we would talk to professors and then we wanna make sure that they felt seen and valued and heard. So we would listen to their case because myself and my colleague are certified mediators. We would mediate a conversation between the faculty member and their chair or the faculty member and the dean. And so we would be advocates for them to feel seen and heard and to make sure that they are, are getting a fair um, shot and that they are being able to, to um, articulate what is troubling them about being whatever identity they hold within the workplace. And then the last thing is that we are working with the institution on an inclusive tenure process, because what I discovered as our, our question and answer session is that many of the students felt like the majority of the times when they felt othered because of their gender, race, sexual identity, or orientation, or whatever, it was in the classroom, not outside the classroom in their social events, but in the classroom by, another, by their professor. And so what we are working with them on is creating an inclusive tenure process, because a lot of times the people who the students are complaining against have tenure, and then they, um, it's difficult in order to hold them accountable because there's nothing that can really happen to them, right? 
So, so making sure that before they even get tenure, that they can prove that they can create inclusive classrooms is critical. So we're working to foster that in addition to um, also providing the deans and the different colleges with diversity and intercultural for the global part of this, our international students training so that they can be much more inclusive in the classrooms as well. So I hope that answers your question, but yes, there's lots of work to be done. Thank you very much. I, we have time for one more quick question. If anybody has it, unmute yourself and ask it now. There being none, okay. Kelly, yeah. first of all, thank you so much. You have made this topic just really come alive. I know um, I, through our firm, we, we have a uh, diversity and inclusion component of our firm, but I wanna commend you on just taking the topic and making it so understandable and relatable and, and I think actionable for every one of us, how you broke it down and, and, uh, and, and really put it in such a welcoming format to all of us. So thank you very, very much. And Prima Donna, thank you for inviting uh, Kelly to speak with us today. So on behalf of everybody, thank you very much for sharing with us today. Wow, what an informative and, uh, and, and, and challenging and delightful uh, presentation. So thank you very, very much for that. Thank you very much, David. It was my honor and pleasure. And again, also thank you to Prima Donna for, for making the recommendation. I always support, I always appreciate your support, my friend. Thank, thank you, thank you both. Now I'll turn it over to DJ Morrow for an inspirational moment. You're muted. <laughs> thank Thanks you. so much. I love it. <laughs> but there's a lot of times people would love to have a mute button on me, so. Uh, so that's good. So anyway, thanks, President David. Um, I just wanted to share one, since we're just tailing off of the Thanksgiving, um, I've shared this with a few people and they said, oh, you need to share that with everybody. Something that my son and I did all of his growing up years to try to focus a little bit more on the real meaning behind holidays, regardless of uh, which ones you're celebrating, whether it is uh, Kwanzaa, Christmas, Hanukkah, the variety of holidays that we have going on during the month of December. There's like 12 different uh, cultural holidays that you can celebrate if you if you really wanted to look those up. But uh, when I worked at the Salvation Army, Christmas time was sort of crazy busy and I would not have the time to get a tree up sometimes. So I started setting my tree up in October as a Halloween tree and then would transform it into a Thanksgiving tree in November. And every day, my son, Riley, and I would write on a little leaf, a, a little cardboard leaf that we would get, uh, something we were thankful for and hang it on the tree. So by the end of the month, we had each had 30 things that we were thankful for. And it was just a really nice way to, to help us remember, you know, it's, it's not about stuff. It's about great things that happen to you. And we would take those and put them in a big jar and... During the year, if we were having sort of a bad day, we could pull one of those out and read it and say, oh, you know, things aren't this bad. Look at this good thing that happened to me or th look at this thing that I'm grateful for or that I was back then. And, and it just reminds us a little bit. So it's just a very simple holiday tradition that we did. And uh, it meant a lot. And I've kept those over the years and I'm sure I'll do something with them. I'm not quite as crafty as some on this call, but but I'll do that. But I want to share my screen with something that, um, again, will sort of cement what I think this holiday season is all about. Make sure I get it the right one. Okay. I hope you can hear. Okay. Wait, let me. Okay. 
So there you go. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season and can't wait to see everybody. Thank you, DJ. I love the smile that it brings to our faces, right? I appreciate that. That's what holidays are about. They should be about happy, fun things, although there are times in our lives where we go through challenging times as well, but let's celebrate. Trish Kirkstra, tell us about business visitation coming up. Thank you, President David. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, great. So for those who might be a little bit newer to our Rotary Club, business visitation is um, put on during the month of January because it's vocational services month. It's a time for us to learn about one another's vocations. And so um, I love what um, Kelly had to say at the beginning of the meeting, at the beginning of her presentation today, when she talked about her story and where we come from, what a great opportunity business visitation is for you to tell your story, how you got into the vocation that you're in and to share with your fellow Rotarians what it is that you do. So the date is January 12th. It's a, it would be a regular meeting day, but instead of going down to um, Thomas Hall, you will sign up to go to a fellow Rotarian's place of business. They will host you for lunch and um, talk about their business. And it's just such a great way to get to know each other better and to learn about what we do and some of the things that happen in our community. One of my most favorite business visitations I ever attended was um, the Trash to Energy plant. And David, I can't think of the Rotarian's name right now who was there, but I learned so much that day. And my whole concept of, um, you know, reuse, reduce, recycle changed. I mean, I was back in the 80s until I went to that. So anyway, um, I encourage everybody to sign up. Please send me an email if you can host and um, we'll get you signed up. And then Tina will put out through our typical Monday message a way for you to sign up to go to someone else's. So uh, please don't hesitate and share um, your vocation with one another. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. <laughs> I look forward to those times to get together on those business visitation days and, and uh, look forward to seeing all who is hosting one, all the businesses. Uh, so let's turn it over to Barbara Kogerman. You've got some exciting news to share with us about something that's coming up here in just, well, another week or so, right? Can you hear me? I can. Oh, yay. Uh, you know, we know how to party and we know <laughs> building relationships is very important in Rotary. And one of the ways we know how to party is when Sarah Stokely is involved. And uh, she is hosting us at her home for our holiday party. It's going to be a week from tomorrow. It's on the 16th. We just didn't want to make it so close to Christmas like the, the New Year's Eve Eve. So it'll be on the 16th. We are going to have the song stylings of, the, of our own Tom Wolf on the piano. We're going to have the beautiful voices of Tulsa Opera coming. The Philstrip resident artists are going to be coming to sing for us. Uh, we will have uh, food, we will have drink, and um, it's just going to be a fun, fun time. It's in Sarah's home is in South Tulsa. You'll see the uh, address on the on, online. Uh, thanks again to Ken McConnell for providing opera singers and Scott Philstrip for providing that program for the opera. And especially thank you to Sarah. It's going to be between 5.30 to 7.30 uh, a week from tomorrow. That's December 16th, Thursday night. So please reserve as soon as possible on DAC to be. You get your Monday message and you get other flyers about it. We need to have a reservation so we know how much food to order and all that. And it's $30 per person. Our social events are self-sustaining, doesn't come out of our dues. So it's priced exactly what it costs us to put it on. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody having a great time, uh, just enjoying all, all 12 holidays that we have in December <laughs> that we now have about. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I, my wife and I look forward to seeing everyone there at the great. At, great. Uh, holiday party. So that should be a, just a wonderful time of, of food fellowship and, and holiday fun. So thank you again for putting that up. And that's during our uh, right after our, our meeting on Wednesday, the next day. So special thanks, first of all, to our gold sponsor, Weeby Trees, Tim Nall. Really appreciate Tim Nall and Weeby Trees for all you have done to sponsor. Uh, and then to our this week's meeting sponsors, 
Bank First, Paul, Bo uh, Pal Bo Paul Bowman, Gordon Greer, Bill Murray, Monte Curry. That was reading two lines at the same time. J.D. Young, Doug Stewart, Trust Company of Oklahoma, Michael Hairston, and Associated Mortgage Corporation, Chuck Wilson. And as you've heard before, our next meeting will be next Wednesday, December 15th at Thomas Hall. Our speaker will be Jose Luis Fernandez. The registration link will be sent to you following our meeting. And what a time, what a great uh, a guest speaker to invite a guest. So please do that. Let's, let's utilize some of those uh, inclusion skills and, 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 and techniques that we've heard about today from our speaker, Kelly. And, and let's put those into practice next week when we, when we invite a guest. And that is where we come to an end today. So thank you very much for joining our meeting today. I appreciate your part in this. And with that, we are adjourned.